Okay, so once again, uh, good evening. Uh, for today, we're going to discuss about the uh, fixed asset. Ano? Uh, so fixed ba na actually? No? So most commonly, no, especially in the field of uh, business, no? uh, we look into the fixed rate band. <clears throat> so, uh, wait. <clears throat> so, when we say a uh, fixed rate bond, no, it is a bound bond, sorry, bond that pays the same level of interest over its entire term. So, let's say for example, if you have a uh, five years contract, same ten percent, ten percent, no. So, an investor who wants to earn a guaranteed interest rate for a specified term could purchase a fixed rate bond in the form of treasury, corporate bond, municipal bond, or certificate of deposit, yung CD, because of their constant in level interest rate. And these are known broadly as fixed income securities. <coughs> so a uh, fixed rate bond <coughs> is a debt in instrument with a level interest rate over, uh, of course, a uh, Fixed rate bonds can be contrasted with floating or variable rate bonds. Now, again, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, a fixed rate bond is a debt instrument with a level interest rate over <clears throat> its entire term with regular interest payments known as coupons. Now, so upon maturity of the bond, holders will receive back the initial principal amount in addition to the interest paid. Typically, long-term fixed rate bonds pay higher interest rates than short-term ones. Of course, now, a, a, a fixed rate bonds is a long-term debt instrument that pays a fixed coupon rate for the duration of the bond. Uh, the fixed rate is indicated in the trust indenture at the time of issuance and it is payable in specific dates until the bond matures. So the benefits of owning a fixed rate bond is that investors know with certainty how much interest will earn and how, or for how long. So as long as the bond issuer does not default or call in the bonds, the bondholder can predict exactly what this return of investment will be. So a key risk of owing fixed rate bond is interest rate risk on or the chance that bond interest rates will rise now making an investor's existing bond less valuable let's say for example let's assume an investor purchase a bond that pays a fixed rate of five percent but interest rate in the economy increased to seven percent and this means that new bonds are being issued at seven percent and the investor is no longer earning the best return on his investment as he could because there is an inverse relationship no, between bond prices and interest rates. So the value of the investor bond will fall to reflect the higher interest rate in the market. And uh, if, the, if he wants to sell his 5% bond to reinvest the proceeds in the new 7% bonds, he may do so at a loss because the bond's market price would have fallen. So the longer the fixed rate bond's term, the greater the risk that interest rates might rise uh, and make the bonds less valuable. So if interest rates decrease to 3%, however, the investor's 5% bond would become more valuable if he were to sell it since a bond's market price increases when interest rates decrease. Again, if interest rate decrease, huh, decrease to 3%, However, the investor's 5% bond would become more valuable if he were to sell it. Why? Since a bond's market price increases, when interest rates decrease, the fixed rate on his bond in a declining interest rate environment will be a more attractive investment than the new bonds issued at 3%. Okay, so... Uh, I just want to play a video presentation of our presenter for this evening. <clears throat> okay. 
please allow me to share my to, to share the screen. If you are going to play a video presentation, don't forget to look uh, with a share sound or computer sound. Then you are now allowed to turn off your. For today's video lesson, I will discuss. Good evening, everyone. For today's video lesson, I will discuss the terms and definition of bond. Bond is the interest-bearing security which promises to pay, which is stated amount of money on the maturity date, and the regular interest payments called coupons. So, sa bond, aside from the face value of the amount, may makukuha kang coupons. So, coupon is the periodic interest payment that the bondholder receives during the time between purchase date and maturity date, usually receive semi-annually. So, the coupon rate is the rate per coupon payment period denoted by R. The price of the bond, the price of the bond at the purchase time denoted by P. So, the par value or the face value is the amount payable or the maturity date denoted by F. Remember that if the price of the bond is equal to the face value, the bond is purchased at par. And if the price of the bond is less than from the face value, the bond is purchased at a discount. And then if the price of the bond is greater than the face value, the bond is purchased at premium. And the term of the bond is a fixed period of time at which the bond is redeemable as stated in the bond certificate. Number of years from time of purchase to maturity date. So the fair price bond is the present value of all cash inflows to the bondholder. So that is the terms, different terms of the bond. For example, Determine the amount of the semi-annual coupon for a bond with a face value of 300000 that pays 10% payable semi-annually for its coupon. So the given is the face value is 300000 and the coupon rate is 10%. So we have to find the semi-annual coupon. So... First, kunin muna natin kung magkano yung annual coupon. So, that is the 300,000 pesos times the 10% which is the coupon rate. So, 300,000 times 0 0.10 is equals to 30,000 pesos. So, the amount of the Annual coupon is 30,000. So, yung hinahanap natin is the semi-annual. Kasi payable siya and semi-annual. So, 30,000, i-divide lang natin siya ng 2. Is equals to 15,000. So, therefore, the amount of the semi-annual coupon is 15,000 pesos. It's another example. So, ito. Let's say si company A gusto magtayo ng Nigo ng condo. So, to raise the money for the constructions of the condo, she offered a bonds. Okay. And then, si Mr. X, si Mr. X, siya yung bond holder. So, siya yung magpapahiram ng pera kay company A. So, the face value is 500,000 na may time maturity in 10 years. And then, the coupon rate is 5%. So, pag sinabing coupon rate, that is the interest, that is the interest na marireceive ni Mr. X kay Company A. So, during the purchase date and then the market value of the maturity date, si Mr. X ay makakareceive ng 5% on face value which is 25,000 pesos every year. So, since this is annually, 
So the one or every year or once a year, makaka-receive si Mr. X ng 25,000 from Company A. And then pagdating naman ng maturity date, ibabalik ni Company A ang 500,000 ni Mr. X. Another example is the coupon interest payment. A government issued a 10-year treasury bond might have a par value or the face value of 500,000 and 2% coupon. Determine the amount of semi-annual coupon. The formula is coupon interest payment is equal to par value times the coupon rate. So, yung... Uh, Coupon rate, coupon interest payment is equal to par value times the coupon rate. So, the 500,000 is the per value times 0 0.02, for, which is the coupon rate. So, 500,000 times 0 0.02 is equal to 10,000 pesos. So, the coupon rate interest annually is 10,000 pesos. So, since ang hinahanap natin is yung semi-annual coupon, yung, yung 10,000 na annual coupon is i-divide natin siya by 2. So, yung 10,000 is equal to, by divide 2 is equal to 5,000 pesos. Kasi yung sa 10,000 annual yun, so, in half year siya kaya by 2. So, 10,000 divided by 2 is 5,000. So, yung, therefore, our semi-annual coupon is 5,000 pesos. Another example of coupon rates. A bond issued with a face value of 1,000 that pays 50 pesos, 50 pesos po yan, coupon semi-annually. So, yung formula natin is coupon rate is equal to total annual coupon payment divided by day for value. So, yung hinahal pa yung annual coupon payment. So, yung given is the 50 pesos coupon semi-annually. So, yung 100 is the total of annual coupon payment. So, yung 50, yung given natin na 50 is semi-annual lang yun. So, 50 times 2 is equal to 100. So, the total annual coupon payment is 100. So, 100 divided by the, the par value of 1,000 is equals to 0 0.1. So, yung 0 0.1, yung second. So, yung since yung coupon rate, yung hinahanap natin, so, we can convert this into percent. So, how we can convert it into percent? Just multiply it by 100%. So, 0 0.1 times 100 is equal to 10%. So, ibig sabihin, yung interest na natatanggap yung sa par value is 10%. So, yung other example natin pa is yung sa maturity or sa yield rate naman. So, a government issued a 10-year treasury bond might have a par value or the face value of 500,000 pesos. And 2% coupon. The amount of semi-annual coupon is 5,000 pesos. So, if the current price or yield is 400,000, what is the maturity yield or matur maturity or yield rate? So, yung hinahanap natin yung maturity or yung yield rate. Interest natin is 10,000. So, we solve this. Ano yung interest nito? 400,000 pesos, which is the current price. So, yung hanap natin. So, yung annual interest na 10,000 divided by the current price na 400,000 pesos. So, 10,000 divided by 400,000 is equal to 0 0.025%. Times Multiply natin siya sa 100%. It's equal to 2.5%. So, 2.5%. So, kapag masababa siya, 
kang binenta kaysa doon sa face value or sa current price. Sa present sa present na price niya less than sa par value that is what we called the discount bond. So, ito yung another problem ng bond price. So, yung 1,000 is the face value 5% interest rate and 6% yield rate and 5 years maturity date. Find the purchase price of each bond on the given date. So, yung given natin is yung face value is 1,000. Then, yung interest rate is 5%. Then, yung yield rate is 6%. Yung maturity date is 5 years. So, yung annual interest payment is equals to the 1,000 for the, is the face value times the interest rate of 0 0.05 or 5%. So, 1,000 times 0 0.5 is equals to 50. So, so, to solve the bond price, the first step is we're going to solve the annual interest payment. So, an annual interest payment is equal to the face value or the par value multiplied by the coupon rate or the interest rate. So, our face value is 1,000 multiplied by 5% or 0 0.05 is equal to 50. At next, once na meron ka ng annual interest payment, ang sur na gagawin mo na is you're going to get the sum of the quotient of the annual interest payment and 1 plus the appropriate yield at 2 maturity. So, since we have 5 years, so that it is equal to the bond price is equal to the quotient. Again, we're going to, to get the sum of the quotient of the annual interest payment. So, our annual payment is 50. So, the quotient divide sabi 1 plus the yield rate which is 6% or 0 0.06 then raise to 1. So, this is for the first year. The bond price is equals to 50 divided by 1 plus 0 0.06 yung yield rate natin raise to 1 so kasi for 1 plus yung 50 divided by the 1 plus 0 0.06 raise to 2 for the second year then plus 50 divided by 1 plus 0 0.06 raise to 3 3 po yan yung sa pangatlo. For the third year, then 50 divided by the 1 plus 0 0.06 raised to 4 for the 4 years. So, pip, pagdating sa dulo, sa pang lima, sa 5 na pang 5 years, isasama na natin yung 1,000 na par value plus the 50% 50, percent, 50 no, the 50 annual interest payment. So, 1,000 plus 50 divided by the 1 plus 0 0.06 raised to 5. And then, yung 50 is divided to 1 plus 0 0.06 raised to 1 is equals to 47.01698 So, ipa-plus mo lang siya. De, ipa-plus mo lang din yung lahat ng uh, sagot sa Price. Then, yun na, yun na yun yung purchase price ng bond. Yun lamang po. Thank you. Okay, so uh, 
it happens that miss ano pala yung other presenter nag-send ng video so i could able also to play her video so this will be the advantage actually for having video submitted no so i could able to play if you were not able to attend our class for an emergency purposes na okay i'll just want to play again another video presentation of her partner no miss arpon partner Suppose that a band has a face value. Suppose that a band has a face value of 100,000 and its maturity date is 10 years from now, the given rate is 5% payable semi-annually. So this time, find the fair price for this bond, assuming that the annual market rate is 4%. Okay. So given uh, an example here, so coupon rate, that is the um, 5% payable semi-annually, and then we have a fees value of 100000 and then we also have here a time of maturity, which is yung 10 years. And we have here the number of periods. So we have here a number of periods of 20 times. Why? Since payable for semi-annually, and then for 10 years kasi siya nababayaran, so times 10 is equal to 20 period. It means that um, 20 times siyang makakareceive ng 5% of 100,000. The annual market value is 4% and kukunin natin yung amount of semi-annual coupon. Since meron tayong 100,000 and that is payable for semi-annual, so twice a year, so 0 0.5 divided by um, 2 times of 100,000, that is 2,500. The bond holder receives 20 payments of 2,500. It means twice a year siyang makakareceive ng 2,500 and 20 times naman siyang makaka-receive ng 2,500. The T is equals to 10 years. So, it means that yung pera na pinahiram mo is kikita pa yun. Yun yung tinatawag na interest depende sa coupon rate. Since ang kukunin natin dito is fair price of this bond, which is kukunin natin yung present value ng 100,000 using this formula. F over 1 plus I raised to N. So, substitute lang natin. So, yung I natin dito is 0 0.04 over 1. Annual marketplace yung 4%. And that is annual. Kaya 0 0.04 divide, divided by 1, still 0 0.04 raised to 10, that is 10 years. So, M is 1 plus I is equal to 100,000. Then, 1 times 10, you can use your scientific calculator to compute the present value of 100,000. So that the answer is 67,556.42. So ito yung present value ng 100,000. So this time, kukuni naman natin yung present value ng 20 payments of 2,500 each. So using the formula, kailangan natin kunin yung equivalent rate ng 4% to semi-annual rate. So, yung M sub 2 natin dyan is yung 1. 
that is the 4% and thus M sub 1 is the 5%. Yung M2 pala natin dyan is the frequency conversion kung saan um, that is the annual. Yung M sub 1 naman is the semi-annually or semi-annual. So, ang gagawin natin is dun sa formula that is 1 plus 0 0.04 divided to 1 raised to 1 half minus 1. Use your scientific calculator again. The answer is 0 0.018039. Pagkukunin nyo yung interest rate or equivalent rate dapat at 8 decimal places palagi para safe tayo sa final answer. To solve the present value of 20 payments, we can use this formula. So, the regular payment of 2,500 times 1 minus 1 plus the value of I raise a negative 20. Use your scientific calculator again. So, the present value of 20 payments of 2,500 each is 40,956.05 plus 67,556.05 which is ito yung present value ng 20 payments natin of 2,500. So, uh, so, ang sagot niya, that will be 108,512.47. So thus, the price of 108,512.47 is equivalent of all future payment, assuming and annual market is 4%. And that's how to calculate the present value of 20 payments of 2,500 each. Okay, so this time, I'll just want to give you additional inputs no, related to the subject. So, uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, no, uh, some other considerations with regards to this uh, topic, of course, is, let's say, for example, an investor uh, could reduce his or her uh, interest. No? So, wait for a while. Okay, so again, uh, an investor could uh, reduce his or her interest rate by choosing a shorter bond term. No, uh, he would probably earn a lower interest rate. So, because a shorter fixed rate bond will typically pay less than a longer term, uh, longer term fixed rate bond. So, if a bond holder chooses to hold his bond until maturity and does not sell it on other. Uh, on the open market rates. Wait. Okay. So, so as I mentioned, if uh, if a bond holder chooses to hold his bond until maturity and does not sell it on the open market, he will not be concerned about possible fluctuations in interest rates. So. The real value of fixed rate bond is sus uh, susceptible to lose due to inflation. Take note of it. Because <clears throat> the bonds are long-term securities, rising prices over time can erode the purchasing power of its interest payment a bond, mark, a bond makes. No? Let's say, for example, <clears throat> if 10-year bond pays 250000 fixed coupons semi-annually, semi semi Okay, so let's say, for example, okay, so once again, again, no, uh, I'll give you an example, no, uh, if at 10-year uh, bond, no, 10 years, no, 
fees, 250,000 pesos. Fixed coupon, si may annually. So it means every, every six months, no? In five years. So the real value of the 250,000 will be worthless today. So when investors worry that advance yield won't keep up with the rising cost of inflation, the price of the bond drops because there is less investor demand for it. Again, a fixed rate bond also carries liquidity risk for those investors who are considering selling the bond before its maturity date. This risk occurs when the spread between the bid price and ask price or asking price of the bond is too wide. So if this occurs and the bondholder is asking no ask, ask price for more than investor want to pay or yung bid price, then the original holder may be placed in a scenario whereby they sell the security for a loss or significantly reduce rate, thereby sacrificing liquidity. Okay? So, I'll just want to give you an additional video presentations on how you'll be able to, uh, I think, to give you more uh, discussions about the Bond Investing 101. Because a while ago, uh, I, I will able to see a questions no, uh, of your classmates uh, relating to... Uh, the difference or if, 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 if bond price formula is same with the dividend discount model formula. Of course not. But uh, to give us more details about this, I will just want to give you the bond 101 discussions, a video presentation, of course, related to this uh, topic. Okay? So... In this video, we're going to do a walkthrough on bond investing. The idea is, what are the basics you need to understand when adding bonds to your portfolio? When I started investing, I didn't really know a thing about bonds, and so I just picked a couple of bond funds, not really understanding that there is a huge difference between the different kind of bonds uh, that you can invest in and the risks associated with the bonds and the potential rewards as well are very different from, say, a short-term bond versus a long-term bond or a bond uh, issued by corporations with shaky financials, for example, called high-yield bonds. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to walk through basically how a bond works. That's what we're going to start with um, and talk about some of the terms. A lot of it's just understanding the terms and concepts. And once you understand that, frankly, that's about all you need in, in order to add bonds to an asset allocation, whether it's 80-20, 60-40, or whatever. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look um, at some examples of some bond uh, funds. We're going to compare the difference between investing in an individual bond and what probably most of us do, myself included, and that is uh, invest in bond ETFs or mutual funds. There are some differences. Uh, of course, going to look at some uh, types of bonds. And then kind of we're going to end uh, the video with sort of three approaches you might consider for your bond portfolio. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do. So let's get right to it. And uh, to understand a bond, I'm going to go to the, the digital whiteboard. And um, the way a bond works, of course, uh, at a high level, a bond is nothing but a loan, right? When you, when you invest in a bond, you're lending money, usually to a government or a corporation. We'll talk more about that. But you're lending money, and they are agreeing to pay you normally a fixed interest rate uh, for the term of the bond. So let's see how this might work. We can imagine... We'll do like a 10-year timeline, and you invest $1,000 in a bond uh, today, let's say, and we'll assume this is all the way over here is 10 years. So this, we'll just assume this is a 10-year bond. Well, what does that mean, a 10-year bond? Well, what it means is that um, each year, and it's usually, uh, for the most part, interest on a bond is paid twice a year. And so you're going to get interest, and we'll just assume the interest rate on this bond is 2%. And they actually call that the coupon rate. Um, and that harkens back to the day when bonds were actually in paper format. You may have seen like on college campuses or in your neighborhood where someone wants to advertise something and they've got those little, they have a piece of paper on a telephone pole and they have those little tabs at the bottom where you can tear off their phone number. Well, that's kind of how bonds worked. And each one of those little tabs was called a coupon. You tear it off and literally present it to the issuer of the bond to get your interest rate. Well, 
That term, of course, everything's digital today, but they still use it. So coupon rate, right? And we'll assume in our example, it's 2%. And so you would get interest effectively every six months. Uh, 2% of $1,000 is, uh, <laughs> what is it? It's 20 bucks. Is that all? Yeah, it's not a lot of money. I started to say 200. I'm pretty sure that's 20% of 1,000. So whatever the interest is, you're going to get that every six months, right? And then if we fast forward all the way to year 10, you're going to get the last interest payment and you're going to get the return of your, your $1,000, okay? And uh, so some of the terminology they would use, they'd say um, the 10 years, they would say this is, this is the maturity. This is when the bond matures, which is just the term they use for saying, all right, the term is up. Here's your last interest payment and here's your $1,000 back. So you could think of this as most bonds as interest only. Right, and then the principal gets paid back at, at the end. So in this case, you know, it's a 10-year bond, has a, a maturity of 10 years. You're going to get interest typically every two months, and uh, uh, excuse me, twice a year. And then at the end of the term, in this case, 10 years, you get your money back. What makes bonds uh, so fascinating, in my view, is that for the most part, again, there's always exceptions, but for the most part, bonds can be bought and sold. So if you own a bond. You could, at any point in this 10-year period, right, you could decide to sell your bond. And that raises um, two important concepts. Because you might think, well, what would I sell it for? What would be the price? I guess it'd just be $1,000, right? I mean, that's the, that's the amount of the bond. They actually call this the par value, right? It's 1000 um, bucks. So I assume if I want to sell it or if I wanted to buy a bond like this, I pay a thousand bucks, right? Well, no, not so easy. Uh, it turns out that the the value of a bond will fluctuate during, in this case, the ten years of its life, and there are two risks uh, associated with bonds, or actually more than two, but two that I think are most important for us. One is called credit risk, and one is called interest rate risk. Uh, credit risk is simply the risk of default, right? It's the risk that whoever you've uh, lent money to, it won't pay you back. They'll either miss one of these interest payments, one or more, or they'll default at the end and they, they fail to give you uh, some or all of your principal back. So that's the risk of default. Now, in the world of bonds, the general wisdom is that U.S. government bonds have zero risk, that worst case scenario, the government can just print money and, and, and pay back bonds, which I guess is kind of what they're doing. Uh, in any event, uh, U.S. government bonds are, are viewed as having no risk. We're going to look at some other bonds, though, where credit risk, the risk of default, is very real. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. That's the first risk. The other risk, and probably the risk you're hearing most about today, is interest rate risk. And if you're new to bonds, it may seem odd. Uh, that, that interest rates could affect the value of this bond. So, for example, let's imagine uh, at year, year one. So we've had this bond for a year. We've gotten our 2% for the first year. We've got nine years left. And let's say that interest on similar bonds, if you were going to buy one you know, at year one, has gone up. It's gone up to 4%. At first glance, you might think, well, that shouldn't affect the value of my bond. I mean, I'm still getting my 2%. At the end of 10 years, I'm going to get my $1,000 back. What, what does that increase to 4% have to do with my bond? Well, let's imagine at this point you wanted to sell it. You advertise your bond and you want to charge 1000 bucks, right? That's the par value. Well, why would, why would folks buy that? Let's imagine you wanted to buy a bond and someone was selling a $1,000 bond at 2% and you say, well, wait a minute, why would I buy your lousy 2% bond? I can go out in the market today and get 4%. And if we think about it, like, oh yeah, that's, that's a pretty good point. So if we really are in desperate need and we want to sell this bond, what do we have to do? Well, we have to discount it, right? We have to lower the price. How much? Well, enough so that the effective uh, yield on the bond is 4%. And the way this works, and there's math behind it, math that I've never bothered to, to dive into because it's not important for the vast majority of, of investors. But the idea would be we want to lower this enough so that the effective yield is, 
is 4%. So let's just imagine that number. I'm just going to make a number up, but let's just imagine it's $950. So let's say you're the new owner. You've bought this bond at year one and you paid $950 for it. Uh, you think, well, so now I start to get 4%, right? No. You're going to continue to get the 2%. Remember, you've bought this bond from another investor. Let's say the U.S. government issued this bond. It's a U.S. government bond. Well, they've got a contract effectively to pay 2%. They don't care that you've bought this bond at a discount because the current interest rate is 4%, right? The, the terms of the bond are 2%. So you're going to get 2% on what? On the original $1,000, right? They also don't care that you paid $950. That has nothing to do with the issue where that was between you and another investor. So they're going to continue to pay the 2% on the par value. That's not going to change, but you only had to pay $950 for this bond. Again, I'm just making that number up, uh, but, but it would obviously in, these, in this scenario be something less than $1,000. Um, but the benefit to you is that once we get all the way out here, you're going to get the full $1,000 back. Once again, the U.S. government doesn't care that you paid $950 for it. They're going to give you back the par value. And it's that difference between this $950 that you paid for it and the $1,000 that you eventually get when the bond matures that makes up the difference between this 2% and 4%. Now, here's the, the really important thing to take away from this, and it's, it's the following. As interest rates go up, the value of existing bonds go down. And we saw it right here. Interest rates went in our hypothetical from 2% to 4%, and the value of the bond went down. Again, it went down here by a made-up number, but it would go down by something. And um, the reverse is true, or the inverse, right? If interest rates go down, the value of bonds go up. Imagine if interest rates fell to 1% after a year. Well, now you've got a bond paying 2% when prevailing rates are only 1%. You want to sell your bond, you're going to get a premium. Again, the same concept, someone might pay, and again, I'm going to make up a number for this premium. We've got to bridge this gap. Maybe they pay $1,020. So they're paying a premium, a premium over and above, and I know this is getting a bit messy, over and above the par value to make up the difference between these two interest rates, because interest rates went down. And if they fast forward to the end, are they going to get $1,020? Nope. They're going to get the par value. And the difference between that par value and what they paid makes up the difference between these two interest rates. So again, the important concept to understand is that as interest rates go up, the value of existing bonds go down, and as interest rates go down, the value of existing uh, of bonds go up. And that presents a, a, a problem for you and I today, and I'll show you why. Um, what you're looking at now is uh, the yield on the 10-year treasury by year. So we're looking here. The latest update was just a few days ago. The yield is 1.31%. I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom. Believe it or not, they have data going back to 1871. Uh, I, yeah. And back then, if you lived back then, you'd get 5.32%. And as we just slowly sort of scroll up, 5%, 4%, 3%, going down, back up to 4%, now we're in the 1920s, 5%. We hit the Great Depression, uh, rates are in the 3%, now down to the 2%. It's not until 1941 that we see a yield under 2%. Now this is on an annual basis. There may have been intermediate you know, months where perhaps it fell below, but on an annual basis, first year, of course, we're in World War II at this point. So um, obviously a lot of things happening that affect uh, the economy you know, globally. Uh, but it only stayed there for a year, jumped back up to 2%, and then up to 3%, 4%. And those of you that are old enough to remember the 70s and 80s, you're, you know what's coming. See these interest rates? Now we're up to 9%, 10%, 14%. 1982, I remember earning 16% on a six-month CD. I still have the paperwork for that CD. Anyway, um, and around here, as crazy as this was, by the way, I remember, you know, you say six months CD. Why didn't you lock in for five years? We were scared uh, interest rates would go would go up. Who wants to lock in at sixteen percent for five years if rates go, you know, twenty percent? I know it seems crazy by today's standards. In any event, um, we enter 
what many call like a 30 plus year bull market on bonds, which basically means uh, the yields were going down as prices go up. And we see that we're still in the eights, the sevens, um, sixes, now we're in the fours, the threes, and uh, back now for the first time since 1941, 2012, we're under 2%. Pops back up, but then, as we all know, uh, uh, 2020, 176, uh, beginning of this year, was just over 1%. It currently stands at 131. Now, why? The greenest urban estate is about to rise in the east side of Metro Manila. Welcome to Park Link. Um, and the concern that many folks have uh, is that uh, that yields will eventually go up. We might not know when, but they, you know, the thinking is they can't stay that low forever. And when they go up, all of the bond and bond funds that you and I own are going to go down in value. That's the concern. And it's a valid one, trust me. The question now that we want to answer, though, is, is there some way we can figure out how uh, an increase uh, in, in interest rates will affect the value of the bond. When we were looking at, at just a minute ago at a, at a sort of a made up example, I was just pulling numbers out of the air. Um, but is there a way to actually sort of get a, you know, a better estimate of how a, a, an increase in interest rates will affect a bond? And the answer is absolutely. And it's called duration. And let me just show you, I'm gonna show you how it works. I'm gonna clear this screen. Um, I'm going to uh, first explain the concept behind duration. There's different ways to calculate it. We don't have to worry about that. All we need to know is the concept. And then we're going to actually look at some sp specific bond funds to show you how that works. So let's go back to our 10-year example. Here's uh, year 10, right? And we've got our bond. We're going to invest uh, $1,000. And it's a, it, we know the maturity, right? The maturity is 10 years. That's great. So um, the idea of duration, the concept is to figure out uh, the average amount of time it will take to get our money back. And at first, uh, when I was learning about these concepts, I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. We get, the, we get, we get our $1,000 back here at year 10. Why isn't the duration 10? Well, duration is measuring all of the money that we're going to receive from this bond. And we don't get all of the money at year 10. We get some interest at the six-month mark, the 12-month mark, twice a year, all the way, right? To the very end and of course at the end we get the, the pot of gold so to speak we get the thousand dollars back so yeah most of the money comes back to us in year 10 but we do get sm currently small amounts since the yields are so low we do get small amounts of money along the way and so what you could think of duration is calculating the average the weighted average time that we get our money back that's i think it's a, a, a good enough definition of duration for our purposes and um Typically, there are some exceptions, but typically the duration uh, is you know, shorter than the maturity because the maturity is you know, all the way out here at year 10. Because we're getting some money along the way, when you calculate that weighted average, it's going to be something less. Let's just assume, again, hypothetical. We'll look at some real life examples in a minute. Let's assume that the maturity is 10 years, uh, but the duration is 8.5 years. We'll just make that number up. What does that tell us? Well, that's what we need to know to understand how interest rates will affect an individual bond or a bond fund. And here's how it works. If rates go up, for every 1% that rates go up, in our hypothetical, the bond will fall in value uh, by an amount, uh, by a percentage equal to its duration. So in this case, 8.5%. If rates went up 2%, this fund would fall twice that, right? What is that, 17%? <laughs> I hope I got my math right. And of course, the reverse is true. If rates go down by 1%, the value of this bond will go up by 8.5%. So the duration is a really important thing, concept to understand. And the good news is, uh, when you're talking about a duration for uh, an ETF or mutual fund, it's really easy to figure out what the duration is. And I'll show you how to do it. Let's go back to uh, the computer. We're gonna run over to Morningstar. We're looking at the moment at the Vanguard Total Bond Market ETF. It's a fund that I've owned in the past, tickers BND. And it tells you right here, effective duration. Boom, there it is. And it's 6.68, right? So again, for this fund, if, if rates uh, on, on, on bonds similar to the bonds owned by this fund were to go up by 1%, the value of this fund would go down by 6.68% or you know, approximately. 
we can see other durations. This is a long-term bond fund from Vanguard. The duration is a lot higher, right? More than double. And so that's why you may hear that the interest rate risk is really significant for longer um, maturing bonds. And, and this is sort of the, in part, the math behind that. The duration is longer. And conceptually, I think it's easy to understand. If you wanted to sell your 2% bond, and uh, the prevailing rates were 4%. You're trying to convince someone to buy it. You know you're going to have to sell at a discount. Well, uh, one question that might come up is, well, how long will the buyer get stuck with this 2% bond when current rates are 4%? You know, how, how long am I going to have to endure you know, this lousy yield? Well, if, if the answer is 30 days, and yes, there are bonds that mature in 30 days, well, that's not very long. Okay, I don't need, I don't need a huge discount just to you know, last for 30 days with this difference. On the other hand, if it's 100 years, and yes, there are century bonds that mature in 100 years, believe it or not, okay, that's a long time. Now, of course, there's a lot that goes into valuing a bond that lasts 100 years, but you get the concept. Uh, the longer the duration, uh, the longer you're sort of stuck with that lower interest rate, the more you're going to want to discount that bond before you're willing to buy it. So that's sort of the, the basic concept behind it. And as we see, here, you can easily find the duration of any bond, ETF, or mutual fund right here in Morningstar. Uh, very, very easy uh, to figure out. Now, this raises another uh, question. So if interest rates go up uh, and the value of a bond goes down, well, what if I own a bond and I just don't sell it? I mean, okay, the value of the bond has gone down, um, you know, but, but what do I care? I'm, I'm not selling it. And can't the same thing happen with the mutual fund or an ETF? And this is where it's important to understand the difference between a bond and a bond fund. Let me go back to the digital whiteboard. We're going to clear it. If you think about a bond, uh, again, we'll use 10 years. And we'll assume a duration of 8.5 years. So again, making that number up. And we're right here. We buy the bond. It's $1,000. Sorry for my poor handwriting. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that these numbers change over time, right? So after a year, it's no longer 10 years until maturity. Now it's nine. And the duration is whatever. We'll just assume 7.5. It doesn't go down, you know, year by year. It changes a little bit over time, but we'll just assume for the moment. The point is, as a bond matures, right, and we move closer to that 10-year mark, uh, the maturity goes down and the duration goes down. And so what, what that means is, over time, the interest rate risk of a bond also goes down. And so you, you imagine if we're right here and interest rates plunge and our bond's only worth $950, well, we'll just hold on to it. I mean, because, you know, again, if we, can, if we can last all the way to year 10, we'll still get our $1,000 back. And we haven't really lost any money. Uh, that's how an individual bond works. Now, there's some things to understand about that, which we'll get to in a minute, but let's compare that to a bond fund. We're going to go back to Vanguard's. How many bonds does the Vanguard Total Bond Market Fund actually own? Well, we, we can figure that out. The number may surprise you. Here we go. Bond holdings. 18,481 bonds. I mean, they are busy over at Vanguard. Can you imagine managing that portfolio? I'm guessing they use computers. Anyway, they are dealing with a lot of bonds, and unlike an individual bond that you and I might own, um, Vanguard isn't just holding these bonds until they all mature and then shutting down the fund. They're constantly buying and selling bonds so that they can maintain an average uh, duration and maturity in line with the goals of the fund. In this case, given the maturity of eight and a half years and the duration, uh, of 6.68, I would call this an intermediate term bond fund. There's short term bond funds, intermediate term and long term. This, I think, would fall into the intermediate term category. And so they're constantly buying and selling uh, bonds to maintain some range of maturity and duration. And if interest rates go up, well, they still have to do that. So they're still selling bonds and taking losses. And at first, that may seem like a really bad idea. Why, why lock in the losses? Just Maybe we should just buy individual bonds. Well, 
There's at least two reasons why individual bonds, pro probably for most of us, not a great idea. The first, first off, it's a real pain to start trying to buy individual bonds. Um, it just, it's just as a practical matter for most folks, it's just, it's not going to work. But the other thing is, there's, a, there is a silver lining when a, when a fund um, sells a bond even at a loss, and it's simply this. Interest rates are going up. Yes, they're selling some of their bonds at losses, but they're replacing them, right? And what are they replacing them with? Well, bonds that are now have that higher yield, because remember, interest rates are going up. So if they're buying new issues, they're getting uh, bonds with a higher coupon rate. If they're buying uh, bonds in, in, in the market because interest rates are going up, they're going to get a deal such that the yield is going up on the fund overall. Now, that in, uh, increased yield won't offset the losses that a bond fund incurs overnight. It can take some time. It can even take years. How long it takes, that sort of crossover point, depends uh, uh, largely on well, what interest rates do, but the duration of, of the fund. But eventually, you sort of earn your money back, if you will, through higher yields. So um, yes, you can buy individual bonds. It's, it's a real chore, except for maybe I bonds. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I really think for most of us, and this certainly for me, um, ETFs and mutual funds are the way to invest in bonds. Yes, they can go down in value uh, when interest rates go up. How much uh, they'll go down depends on their duration. But over time, they will make that back up with higher yields on the new bonds that they are, are, are buying. So I know it's sort of a lot to digest, but I do want to point out that there is a difference between a bond and a bond fund. Um, and uh, two things I want to show you uh, before we move on. The first is this box. They call it the style box. They have these for stocks, which you may have seen, but they also have them obviously for bonds over at Morningstar. And what this tells us, the, the, the horizontal tells us the interest rate risk. Is it limited? Is it moderate? Or is it extensive? So limited would basically be short-term bonds. And I think I might have an example. Let's see. Yeah. So this is a Vanguard short-term bond fund, and you can see the box that's colored is in the limited column. And that makes sense. We see the duration is only 2.79 years. So that's limited. Uh, we were looking at uh, the, the total bond market fund. It's got mo moderate interest rate risk. If we go to long-term bond fund, it's extensive. So that's what those three mean uh, across the top. Uh, down the side, this re references what we talked about earlier, credit risk, the risk of default. And the way they look at it is, what's the quality, the credit quality of the bonds? Is it high? Is it uh, sort of in the middle or is it low? So in terms of safe bonds, you want something in the high range. And if we go to, here we go. This is um, Vanguard short-term inflation protected security. So these are tips issued by the US government. So as you would expect, credit is high. What about bonds issued by corporations that kind of uh, are below investment grade, maybe have shaky financials? Well, that would be a Vanguard high yield corporate fund. And you can see the credit quality is low. So that's what those, uh, that's kind of how to read the style box. Now, um, I want to show you one other thing before we move on. And these are called bullet shares. They're issued by Invesco. And now it's making me answer some questions. I, I mentioned this uh, just because it may be of interest to you. You Remember, I, I mentioned with an individual bond, if interest rates go up, you could just hold the bond if you want to, to maturity, and you get all your money back. I still kind of view that as a loss because you're giving up opportunity, right? Uh, but that's how an individual bond works. And as I mentioned, with funds, uh, you know, they're constantly buying and selling. So if interest rates go up, at least, at least initially, you're going to take a hit. Well, are there, are there funds that allow you to invest easily in hundreds, if not thousands of bonds, but actually work like an individual bond where they don't buy and sell and you just hold the fund until maturity and at maturity, uh, the fund basically shuts down and gives you your, you know, the last interest payments and the rest of your principal back. And the answer is, yep, bullet shares. And they have corporate bond funds. I didn't mean to click on that. Let me go back. They have high yield corporate bond and they have emerging market portfolios, and they also have municipal bonds, which we haven't talked about yet, but uh, we'll come back to that. So I want to just mention bullet shares. I, I personally don't feel a need for that kind of product, but I understand why it exists and it could be useful to some of you. So I wanted uh, to mention it 
um, uh, there you go. So having said all of that, now let's talk about sort of the types uh, of bonds. And I, I'll start with actually municipal bonds. Since we just mentioned them a second ago, they're, you know, sometimes here I'm called munis. They're issued by local governments. Um, they might fund, I don't know, bridges where you live or hospitals or, or whatnot. And um, uh, the, the big thing to understand about munis is that there's no federal income tax. There may not be state income tax. It depends. Uh, Vanguard has a, a muni bond fund. I mean, most of the big um, uh, mutual fund companies do. And, uh, but they have, because they don't have, they have tax advantages, the yields are, 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 are tend to be lower than other comparable bonds based on maturity. And so the, the real key, there's really two things to know about municipal bonds. One, if you're going to own them, you want to own them in a taxable account. There's no point in owning a municipal bond in a, in a, in a retirement account. And two, they're basically best for people in the high tax brackets because, you know, the, the higher your tax bracket, the bigger the advantage of, of having, not having to pay some taxes on it. So that, those are municipal bonds. There are, of course, treasuries. Uh, U.S. government issued bonds. They, they kind of break them down into uh, treasury bills, which are short term, under a year maturities, and bonds, uh, which go up to 30, 30 years. So you have treasuries. You have mortgage-backed securities, which just as the name suggests, bonds that are backed by mortgages. You have corporate bonds. So these could be issued by Apple or Microsoft or you know, foreign companies. Uh, but you have corporate bonds. Um, a, a part of the corporate bond you have are what are called high-yield corporate bonds. And let me actually show you those. We looked at them briefly. This is, uh, here we go. This is the Vanguard High Yield Corporate uh, uh, Bond Fund. High yield, another name for that, which you may have heard, are junk bonds. Now, junk bonds, I, I, I don't like, I don't, it's kind of a cool name. I don't like it because it suggests they're junk and they're not. But high yield bonds are, are issued to companies that are below investment grade. So we can look at that here. And let me make that a little bigger for you if I can. Here we go. So basically anything below triple B would be considered below investment grade, or right? BB and higher is investment grade. So for this high yield bond fund, you can see the vast majority of the bonds are either double B or B. Uh, there's some that are below B, not a lot. Um, and there's actually a little bit that's, that's a investment grade, but the vast majority falls into this category. And the thing to keep in mind uh, is that uh, you know, there's a greater risk of default. Default. Now, that's the bad. Th that's the bad news. The good news is yields tend to, to be higher, right? So I guess that's uh, the good news. And in fact, we can just take a stroll through these funds briefly um, and look at the different yields. So this is a total bond market fund. Uh, it's got a 12-month yield of 2%. It was an intermediate term fund. Uh, Vanguard's long-term bond fund has a yield of 2.91%. The corporate, the high yield corporate is 4.3. You can see that right there, 4.3. So in effect, it's trying to compensate you for the additional risk of default or, or credit risk. We can look at short-term inflation protected securities and this yield ain't gonna be pretty. <laughs> at least I'm not expecting it to be. Well, 1.35, 12 month yield. The SEC yield, which is there's a formula over the, the yield for the last 30 days, and they may even give an explanation if we click on this. Yeah, based on a 30 day period ending on the last day of the previous month. The purpose of the SEC yield is so that you can compare one fund to another. There's a, 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 a way that it has to be calculated and, and, and that way you're comparing apples to apples. And yes, the SEC yield on this short-term tip is negative. And if you think to yourself, well, wait a minute, what's that do to duration? Because you're supposed to get these interest payments along the way, which makes duration shorter than maturity. What happens when the yield is negative? Well, um, at least according to Morningstar, yeah, the duration and the maturity are the same. I'm not sure that's technically correct, but you get the idea. And then we could go to just a regular short-term bond fund. By the way, here, Maturity and duration are not the same, but this fund probably has a positive uh, SEC yield. Let's see. Yeah, positive SEC yield of 51 basis points and 12-month um, yield of 148 uh, basis points. So um, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I hope this is helpful. What I want to do is talk about tips for a second. 
And then we're going to finish up with th kind of taking everything we've learned, and, and I'm going to give you at least three approaches to the bond portion of a portfolio that I, that I like. So um, you remember, we talk about interest rate risk, obviously a big, big risk. And what causes interest rates to go up? Well, certainly inflation, right? If we start to see inflation, um, it, it causes interest rates to go up for a number of reasons. One, the federal government, the, the Fed could raise rates to try to um, keep inflation in check. Um, and just investors, you know, if you if you believe inflation is going to go sky high, you want more interest to to uh, compensate for that higher in, in inflation. So we could see inflation go up. Who knows? But there are a couple of types of bonds that um, rather than having a fixed interest rate, which is kind of what we've been talking about so far, they'll actually adjust the the uh, the interest rate or the way interest rate is calculated based on inflation. And the two I'm thinking of are I bonds and tips. Now I'm going to do a separate video just on I bonds and tips. For today, I want to focus on tips. Why? Because I bonds can't be purchased as part of a mutual fund. You, you have to buy them direct for the government and you're basically limited to $10,000 a year. So when you're trying to do an asset allocation in a portfolio, yeah, you may own some I bonds, but it's kind of hard to, to, to really use them effectively as part of a 60-40 or 80-20 or 90-10 portfolio. So the idea of tips, I want to talk conceptually, uh, is that if, if inflation goes up, there's an adjustment that gets made to tips. It's the, they actually adjust the principal amount of the tip, the, the par value, sort of, rather than the interest rate itself. But the mechanics don't matter. If interest rates uh, go up, uh, what you earn from the tip can go up to it can protect you from inflation. The way to think about a tip is that it's just like a treasury, but they've, they've added an insurance policy. Now, it's not literally an insurance policy, but I think this conceptually is an easy way to understand it. They've said, look, we're going to give you this insurance policy. So if inflation goes up, you'll get more from this bond. If you buy a treasury, you get whatever the, 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 the rate is. You're not going to get more. But with tips, you got this insurance policy uh, and um, you, know, you could get, you get more when, when there's inflation. Of course, as you know, there's always a catch. There's a cost uh, to that insurance policy, right? The, the, through the yields on tips, there's a cost. That's why we saw just a moment ago, the current yield on the, on the particular tip fund we were looking at was negative, right? So you're paying for that, that benefit. Nothing's free in life, right? There's no free lunch. So you're paying for that, insur that inflation protection. And the question becomes, well, will it pay off? I mean, is it work? Should I buy that insurance or not, right? Well. The short answer is no one really knows. If inflation ends up being more than we expect, we being the market, yeah, you, you would have wanted the policy, tips will pay off. Um, if it turns out to be lower than expected, you've just wasted your money on an insurance policy and you'd have been better off with just a regular old US Treasury bond. Now, the question becomes, well, okay, well, what should I do? We're gonna get to that in just a minute when I talk about the three approaches to bond investing. Before we do that, I wanna show you one more thing that you may you know, may find useful. Fred, right? This is um, an economic. This is a basically a database. Um, it's from the St. Louis Fed. You can see that. Uh, I think you can see that up here in the URL. Um, and this is what's called the five-year break-even inflation rate. And this is basically looking at the difference in yields between a five-year Treasury and a five-year tips. And actually, if we scroll down here, and I will try to make this a bit bigger for you. But it says the break-even inflation rate represents a measure of expected inflation derived from the five-year treasury and five-year tips, basically. And you can see it over time. So right now, they're expecting inflation. And when I say th they, I mean the market, based on the buying and selling of tips and treasuries. They're expecting inflation over the next five years to be, uh, as of July 16th, 2.52%. If we go down to the, to the terrible you know, beginning of COVID when the entire global economy shut down, no one could work, you couldn't buy much, you know, people weren't spending. Look at that, the, the expected inflation uh, rate, the break-even inflation rate was just 0.14. Now, of course, it, it turns out uh, that the market was wrong, or at least so far they've been wrong, but the market is never right. It's always evolving and changing based on, you know, the best information that we have. But this shows you the break-even point, and right now it's at 2.52%. All right, so I hope this has been helpful. I wanna walk through what I think are just three sort of simple ways to think about bonds for an, an asset allocation. Again, whether it's 
uh, 80, 20, 90, 10. And I will tell you that my uh, preference is to keep things simple. I, I avoid high yield corporate bonds. And my, my reasoning is I'm looking for my bond fund to be the source of safety and security and you know solid. I'm not looking to take risks in my bond fund. I've got my stocks to, to do that for me. Thank you very much. So that's my approach. I don't, I don't use high yield uh, corporate bonds. I used to, I don't anymore. Don't generally get into emerging market debt funds either for the same reason. And generally, um, I, I don't even bother with international bond funds. I will tell you that I'm starting to look at those things a little more given the terrible yields that we have right now, but frankly, they're bad everywhere. So uh, that's just my approach. So given that, um, I'm gonna show you th three approaches to, to, your, to your bonds. We've looked at, we looked at some of them. The first one, something I did for many years, is just uh, you know the Vanguard Total Bond Market Fund. And if you're at Fidelity or Schwab or wherever, they're gonna have similar funds. And um, it's just one fund and you're done. That's your bond portfolio. I think this is a perfectly reasonable approach. It's an intermediate term uh, bond fund. I like that. I'm, I'm, I'm just too risk averse on, in the bond portfolio to go with long-term bonds. Uh, and that's hurt me at times. Long-term bonds have performed extremely well in recent years. If we look at the portfolio though of this bond, again, we've looked at this, the duration, about 6.68 years. So that's an intermediate term uh, bond fund. Here's what I wanna show you. This is, these are the types of bonds it owns. About half of it is government bonds. Uh, it's got about a, a quarter in uh, uh, corporate and securitized, I'm guessing, I think these are mortgage backed securities. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I'm sure some of you will correct me in the comments if I got that wrong, but I'm guessing that's what that is. And we can look at the, the credit quality. It's all basically with some minor, minor exceptions. Uh, investment grade, BBB all the way up to AAA. And um, so you get, you know, you get a mix of corporate, um, government, some mortgage back. Now, the one thing you won't see in here are tips. So if tips are important to you, this, this approach won't work. Uh, I've got something else for you guys in a minute. Um, but this, I think, is a perfectly uh, good uh, approach. The second approach would be uh, just a U.S. government bond fund. And so uh, let me show you one. And I just realized I don't have it up. So we're just going to Google it. Vanguard. Uh, we'll do inter intermediate term U.S. government bond ETF. It could be an ETF or mutual fund. And here it is. Let's pull it up in Morningstar. VGIT. You could also do short term. Again, you're, it's a trade off. Short term, the interest rate risk isn't as much. Intermediate term, there's a little more interest rate risk, but you also have potential for more yield. I tend, right now, I'm kind of split between short term and intermediate term. Normally, I'm intermediate term. It's just that yields are so low uh, that I've, I've drifted towards shorter term. Uh, so you could do either, but we'll look at this fund as our example. Um, and again, it's all US government bond funds. But I, I think that's perfectly fine. It's got a duration of 5.4. You can see that there. Um, and yep, 99.91% of the fund is in government bonds and 100% uh, in AAA. The 0 0.02, maybe they've got some derivatives or something in there. I don't know. But the point is very secure bond funds. So this is a second approach. Um, and I think it's certainly a reasonable approach. The third approach would be to, to do a mix to take 50% of whatever your bond allocation is and put it in something like uh, an intermediate term US Treasury fund, right? And, and put the other half in tips. I would tend to match the duration. So for example, if I were gonna do a Vanguard intermediate term Treasury fund, I would be inclined to do a Vanguard intermediate term tips, if they have that. Let's see, yeah, here we go. Uh. I'm going to actually go over to Morningstar if I can find it. That's short term. Maybe they just, well, they have an immediate term. I'll just look at it at Vanguard. Let's see if we go to portfolio. They'll tell us the duration. Yeah, effective duration is 5.7 5 years. And it is tips, right? Yeah, intermediate term. No, that's intermediate term treasury. I wonder if they had, they may not have an intermediate term tips fund. Well, in any event, you could do short term, which would be, I'll look that up and leave a note in the comments. Here's a short-term fund. The duration is, is of course, shorter. Um, but I would take half and put it in, in treasuries is the real point, and the other half in tips. And you might say, well, what's the logic behind that? I actually got this from David Swinson. We've talked about the Swinson portfolio. He unfortunately passed away recently, um, but he, he ran the endowment at Yale. 
And in his sort of recommended portfolio, that's exactly what he does. Half the bonds and treasuries, half the bonds and tips. And the idea is if inflation is higher than we expect, tips will pay off. If it's lower than expected, the treasuries will pay off. And since we don't really know which way it's gonna come out, we'll just cover our bases. Half of the bond fund and treasuries, half of your bond allocation and tips. So that's the Swenson approach. I followed that for, for quite a while. My, my only uh, concern about that approach today is that man, the, it's hard for me to stomach putting money in a negative, in, in, a, in a fund with negative yields. Um, even if it does give me that inflation protection, I really have a hard time doing that. But generally, I think it's a, a, certainly a, a good approach. So there you go. Um, I know I kind of moved through this quickly. There's certainly a lot more we could look at in bonds, but I think this gives you at a high level what you need to know to begin investing the bond portion of, of your, your asset allocation you know, with some understanding of how bonds work. I've given you three approaches uh, to how you might build the bond portion of uh, your, your investment portfolio. Certainly not uh, the only three ways, but I think they're pretty solid. Uh, so if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. Uh, I would, would love to help you out any way I can. Okay, so thank you very much for a second. Okay, now, a while ago, there was somebody asking about the, uh, what will be the question, no? Uh, hmm. uh, real return and uh, real rate return, no? So I already uh, give you a, a an idea on how you'll be able to differentiate. Again, uh, a rate return no? uh, or a real rate of return formula is the sum of one plus the nominal rate divided by the sum of one plus the inflation rate, which then is subtracted by one. So the formula for the real rate uh, of return can be used to determine the effective return of an investment after adjusting for inflation. So the nominal rate is the stated rate of nominal return that is not adjusted for inflation. So <coughs> the rate of inflation is a uh, inflation inflation is calculated based on the changes in price indices, which are the price of the group of goods. So one of the most commonly used of price indices is the consumer price index or the CPI. Although uh, the consumer price index is widely used, a company or investor may want to consider using another price index or even uh, their own group of goods that relates more to their business when calculating the real return. The real return. On the other hand, no, a while ago somebody asking about rate of return. <clears throat> so a rate of return is the net gain or loss of an investment over a specified time period expressed by a percentage 
of the investment initial cost. So, when calculating the rate of return, you are determining the percentage change from beginning of the period until the end. Okay? So the rate of return is used to measure the profit or loss of an investment over time. So the metric of rate of return can be used on a variety of assets from stocks to bonds, real estate, and art. Now, so the effects of inflation are not taken into consideration in the simple rate of return calculation, but are in the real rate of return calculation. So the internal rate of return takes into consideration the time value of money. So a rate of return can be applied to any investment vehicle from real estate to bonds, stocks, and fine arts. So the rate of return work with any asset, provided that the asset is purchased at one point in time and produce cash flows at some point in the future. So investments are assessed based in part on past rates of return, which can be compared against asset of the same type to determine which investment are the most attractive. So many investors like to pick required rate of return before making an investment of choice. Okay, so uh, there's somebody who's asking about the question. <clears throat> okay. So, your classmate asking about another question po, between stocks and bonds, ano mas maganda ang invest? Mag-invest? Paano bibili ng tamang bond na dapat bibilihin? So, okay. So, again, stocks, no? Give you partial ownership in a corporation. While bonds are alone, no? from you to a company or government. So the biggest difference between them is how they generate profit. Stock must appreciate in value and be sold later on the stock market, while most bonds pay fixed interest over time. Okay, so it's up to you. Uh, again, uh, lahat naman ng business, sumusugal tayo. No? Okay, so again, stocks represent partial ownership or equity in a company. So when you buy stock, you're actually purchasing a tiny slice of a company, one or more shares. No? And the more share you buy, the more of the company you own. And let's say a company has a stock price of 50 million per share, and you invest 2,500 million no? uh, or 50 shares for each. No? So now imagine over several years, the company consistently performs well because you're a partial owner, the company success is also your success. And the value of your shares will grow just like the value of the company. Of course, the opposite is also true. If the company performs poorly, the value of your shares could fall below what you bought them for. In this instance, if you sold them, you'd lose money. Again, stocks are also known as corporate stock, common stock, corporate shares, equity shares, and equity security. Companies may issue share to the public for several reasons. But the most common is to raise cash that can be used to fuel future growth. How about the bonds? Now, bonds are a loan from you to a company or government. There's no equity involved, nor any shares to buy. Put simply, a company or government is in debt to you when you buy a bond. And it will pay you interest on the loan for a set period. So after which it will pay back the full amount you bought the bond for. But bonds are in complete risk-free. If the company goes bankrupt during the bond period, you'll stop receiving interest payments and may not get back your full principal. Now, again, uh, with bonds, you usually know exactly what you're signing up for and the, the regular interest payments can be used as source of predictable fixed income over long periods. So the, the duration of bond depends on the type you buy, but commonly range from a few days to 30 years. Likewise, the interest rate known as yield will vary depending on the type and duration of the bond. Okay? So while uh, both instruments seek to grow your money, 
the way they do it in returns they offer are very very different. Okay, so maybe it's too clear now, no? For somebody who asked me about, so what will be the best between the uh, uh, bonds and stocks, no? So when you hear about equity in the market, it's a different part. No? So uh, Actually, that's typically referring to stocks and bonds, respectively. So, equity is the most popular liquid no? uh, financial asset. No? So, of course, an, an investment that can be easily converted into cash. So, corporation often issue equity to raise cash to expand operation. And in return, investors are given the opportunity to benefit from the future growth and success of the company. Kaya na, pag hindi nga naging successful, yun lang ang stocks. So buying bonds means issuing a debt that must be repaid with interest, no? So para na lang ng hirap na lang yung government, then may fixed rate, no? Kaya lang kapag during ng time na nakakontra kayo na, tapos kailangan lang nag-fold din yung government or yung private, same po na ganun mo, no? Okay? So again, you won't have any ownership stake in the company kapag bonds po, unlike nung stocks. But you will enter into agreement that the company or government must pay fixed interest over time as well as the principal amount at the end of that period. Okay, so stocks and bonds are generate cash in different ways too. How? To make money, kasi ang tanong naman na napakakorok pa ano eh, no? To make money from stocks, you need to sell the company share at a higher price than you paid for them to generate a profit or capital gain. Let's say, for example, you have 5 million stocks sa ABS-CBN. Then, tapos ibibenta mo sa akin ng 10 million. Ito, kumita ka. Capital gains can be used as an income reinvested, but they will be taxed as long-term or short-term capital gains accordingly. At doon po kumukuha ng sweldo ang gobyerno, pagpapagawa ng ating mga kalisada, at kung ano pa, doon sa mga taxes natin. Okay? So, when you say treasury bonds and notes, Every six months po until maturity yun. Pag sinabi natin treasury bills, only upon maturity. Pag sinabi corporate bonds, semi-annually, quarterly, monthly, at, or at maturity. Okay, so actually you have a lot of things to discuss about how you able to differentiate the bonds and uh, stocks. But uh, for the minute, I'll just give you some uh, important, no? important and uh, most commonly uh, maybe uh, information related to bonds is us when we are going to compare the, bo the both, you know, both, no? Okay. So I think that's it.